It's true. I was here back in 1976 when they opened the first trauma center. And I, here at trauma unit here and so um, I'll talk about that in a little bit this this cartoon is also outdated I remember my mother told me when I first got my driver's <laughs> license make sure you wear clean underwear and all that kind of stuff I have a feeling today people just say please wear underwear <laughs> so so in 1966, a white paper came out. It was called The Accidental Death and Disability, Neglected Disease of Modern Society. So this was a national paper that came out, and they said, people are dying right and left because we have no system to take care of patients that are involved in injuries. And at that time, a lot of it was centered on motor vehicle crashes. And so um, that came out, and in 73, um, the federal government, Congress passed the Emergency Medical Services System Act, and that provided money so that we could get some EMS system going. You know, you heard about ambulance chasers and all that kind of stuff. Somebody just bought an ambulance, they go check a car wreck, and they throw the patient in and bring them to whatever hospital, um, and, and uh, we didn't have very good patient care. And then there was a federal um, block grant that came around. And so in, in 1976, UCSD uh, got one of those federal grants and we opened the trauma unit. It was a five bed ICU and um, two bed resuscitation area and it's where the burn unit IMU is now, you know where all that is now? So it was, we were very cozy there. I mean it was just five beds in a row. <laughs> we were good friends. We, we just turn around, oh hand wash and help lift the patient up in the next bed um, and we were learning I mean there was nothing there was uh, a trauma system in Maryland but uh, there really weren't that many this was the start of it and we were the only one obviously in San Diego to have a trauma unit and I remember Dr. Wachtel who was head of the burn unit and also took call in our trauma center and he said I'm walking in here, it's like brownie in movement. You guys are bouncing off of one another, you know, the nurses are doing this, the doctors are doing that, and uh, we were all new, so we were learning. But a lot of what we do now in the recess room, where you've got your monitoring nurse and your, your um, nurse that takes, uh, that uh, rotates and circulates, that all started back there when we first had our trauma unit. And so at that time, we're also a unit. We weren't even a center. We were building on that as well. We didn't have CT scan in-house in 24 hours a day. I mean, it's unheard of now, but that's the way we developed. And um, we still had no system in San Diego. Patients were going, motor vehicle patients, gunshots, stabbing, were going to the closest hospital because there was no big system. And so what we would have to do is the attending surgeon that was head of the unit, myself, and the person that was the trauma program manager at that time, we would go to each of the 22 emergency departments and introduce ourselves and say, hi, we're here. If you have a patient that needs a higher level of care, please send them to us. And so we did get some. We got a lot of patients that had no money. And we got a lot of patients um, that were really sick. And they said, hey, we can, we can send these patients to UCSD because we know they have this trauma unit. We didn't care. We wanted everybody that we could get. And then it kind of got, the paramedics kind of saw, wow, they've got a system over there at UCSD. And so they would kind of like break the rules sometimes. Am I saying this on film? But they would. This is a long time ago. They were breaking the rules. And they would um, bring a really sick patient to us because they knew that, that we had a team ready to go. So that's how, that's how we started. Then in 1977, Dr. Virgilio from Scripps Mercy, then called Mercy Hospital, and he was, um, he was in the service over in Vietnam, and this is what he said, if you are seriously injured on a major highway in San Diego, you, you have less of a chance of surviving than a Marine over in a rice paddy. So, and we learned a lot from our war experience. Um, they started field resuscitation see the movie MASH and that type of thing yeah so that that's where they kind of started that that was Korea of course but there was field resuscitation um, providing some type of, um, of uh, medical assistance to the guys in the field getting them out of there putting them on the helicopter bringing them to the MASH units and um, they found that it really helped there was a big difference in the mortality um, rates between World War two and uh, or World War I in Vietnam, so that really helped. And every single time there's been a war, the civilian population has learned from it. That's where our, um, for instance now, with the massive transfusion, where we do one-on-one -on -one blood transfusion, that type of thing, that's coming from a rat. 
and from uh, Afghanistan, so we always learn something. Um, and this obviously is an old slide, and it just talks about the trimodal distribution of death. And so initially, you know, a lot of patients die on scene. They got major um, aortic injuries, major brainstem injuries, they stop breathing, they could have spinal cord injuries, and then they get to us, we have that golden hour that they talk about, um, and then some patients still are really sick and they might die of their head injury or attention pneumothorax. Um, pelvic fracture is really bad with anticoagulation and a lot of bleeding. Then they, if they survive that, then sometimes down the line they'll go ahead and they'll, um, some of them sub, uh, succumb to sepsis, that type of thing. So, San Diego had no trauma system and then they really fought hard here to get a study done because they felt that our, our uh, population was not being really well served. So we contracted with the Amherst group. They did the Amherst study. And this is, had to be kind of like n not too political, uh, non-political. And so it was the Hospital Council of San Diego and Imperial Counties that contracted with them to do this study. And that association still around now. And they basically they did an autopsy study. They looked at the autopsies, they looked at what happened to the patients, and they had, they found that we had a, a preventable and potentially preventable death rate of 21%. Inexcusable, okay? So, but there were politics in San Diego, and people did not want necessarily to have specific hospitals be trauma centers. They were afraid they were going to lose patients, they were going to lose money, they were going to lose prestige. So there was a big push against this. However, we really had the media on our side. I don't know if you know Doug Curley. Um, he's still kind of around, um, but he was on the, on the news stage every single week talking about trauma centers and how important it would be in a trauma center. So with that media support and everything, we finally got um, the trauma system. So just so you know how this works, the Emergency Medical Services Authority up in Sacramento gives the counties the authority to set up trauma systems and trauma centers in their counties. Okay, so it's our local, L for local, local emergency medical services agency here that system. They go to the Board of Supervisors, they say, hey, this is what we want to do. And so what they did is they put out a request for a proposal and they said, if you want to be a trauma center, this was back in the 80s, if you want to be a trauma center, tell us what you have, what are your resources, what do you plan to do. There were certain regulations that had to be followed called Title 22 from the state. And so everybody was ready to do that RFP. I, everybody was stressed out. I remember the books were like this big. We had six of them. Um, and so finally in August of 1984, the trauma system in San Diego was um, born. So it wasn't now that the paramedics went to the closest hospital. If the patients met certain triage criteria as a major trauma victim, they would bring those patients to their, the, their trauma center in their catchment area. So, San Diego has a bunch of trauma policies um, and base hospital policies and paramedic policies, okay? And these are what, what are followed throughout the county. Of course, they get input from everybody, but um, that's what we follow. So, the um, designation verification, the county designates us. They have the authority from the state. The American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma, they verify us. So, and the way this came about, and we're, of course we're having re-verification in March, so we're all kind of crazy, but the way this came about is in the old days when the county would go and do, um, they would want to, we have a contract with the county, because we're a trauma center, so we have a contract. So they have to make sure that we're following the rules. Because if there was ever an untoward effect on a patient, a bad outcome on a patient, and we weren't following that rules, we didn't have that CT scanner in house, we didn't have that, that neurosurgeon available or something like that, and the trauma center got sued, the county would also get sued. We have a great relationship with them, but they take this, they take this very seriously and they make sure that we have to follow our contract compliance rules. So in the old days, when they would go around to all the different trauma centers and say, okay, we would get, they would hire somebody. They would get a trauma surgeon, they would get a um, hospital administrator, they would get a neurosurgeon, and then they would get a nurse administrator. And they would take this team out to the different trauma centers, have them review patient charts, have them all the, review all the paperwork to make sure that this was happening. 
Then the trauma centers went to him probably in the 90s, mid 90s, because I used to do a few of those site reviews. And they said, you know what, we want to support the American College of Surgeons. You know, we belong to that agency. They have a process whereby they go and they verify. Is it okay if they come out and verify and then the county can do their little things? County's looking at the um, nursing education, the, the skill stations you've had, that kind of stuff, and the American College of Surgeons sends out two physicians to look at patient charts and do a bunch of other stuff. So they said yes. So that's why we have a designation and verification. Sometimes confusing. Okay. Are you familiar with the trauma centers in San Diego? We've got two level ones. We've got level... Um, Two, three level two adults and uh, level two pediatric, which um, Rady Children's, of course. And the system was set up such that it's not that the sickest patients go to the level one. Everybody is expected to provide the same patient care, the same level of patient care, whether you're a level one hospital or a level two, and that's why we have our different catchment areas. Um, there's a little bit of difference in level one, more education, research, and you have to have a residency um, program. But other than that, other things are pretty much the same. So in addition to the trauma centers, the trauma system includes the base hospitals. So all the adult um, trauma centers are a base hospital. Grossmont and Tri-City is a base hospital. And that's where the medics call into the MICNs and say, we got this patient. And we'll go over that a little bit more later on. So this slide is a little bit old, but um, I just didn't get the newest statistics. But our base hospital used to be here, and then I'm sure for some kind of financial reason, it moved, they contracted our base hospital, and the base hospital was actually up in Kearney Villa, okay, Kearney Mesa, um, and it was contracted with American Medical Response, which is an ambulance company, so our MICNs, our base hospital nurse coordinator, were all off-site, okay, and Sometimes that's not good because, you know, you don't, the nurses that are doing the calls up there don't know the nurses in the emergency department here, don't know the recess nurses, never get to see the paramedics. So if there's some kind of problem with the medics, the medic can't stick his head in and say, what did you send me here for? Or whatever that could be. So then they decided, oh, let's bring the base hospital back here. So it is. And since that time, um, the call volume has really gone up. And it's much higher than this now. So um, we're getting a lot more calls. We're getting a lot more patients, which is good. That's a lot of stuff up there, uh, basically, just so you know. So the, the medics call in to the base hospital and they speak to the um, uh, MICN. And so there is a radio there. On that radio is one channel, okay? And there's also a phone in there. And so the MICN talks to the paramedics on, on the uh, radio on that one channel. We're trying to get two channels. and. Um, She's able to direct the paramedic, bring the patient here as a major trauma victim, bring the patient here as a trauma resource, or it's a heart attack, or whatever it is. There are certain things the medics can do out in the field. They've got standing orders. Other than that, the MICN's got to get them the orders. So she's got to call right next door within the same room the base hospital physician. There's always a base hospital physician on in the emergency department and say, this patient needs whatever drug it is. And um, so that's the way that system works. Here is our catchment area. So you can see that we have um, the smallest area and we also have the lowest population. So this is, when, when this started off in 84, the population uh, was about the same for all the different catchment areas. But this has changed as South Bay has really been built up in North County and, uh, and um, uh, up in the Palomar area as well. But you can see our little catchment area uh, and where it is, but we still have the most trauma patients. We get a lot of patients from Imperial County. Um, so I have someplace on the side a triage algorithm. So if a patient has, um, there's physiological criteria when our patients come. If their Glasgow Coma Scale is 14 or uh, less than 14, um, they come here. If they have any kind of uh, anatomic injury, for instance, you know, if they have a gunshot wound in certain areas of their body above the elbows, if they have an amputation um, above the wrist, above the ankle, they come here. And if there's a um, significant mechanism of injury. Um, we have a triage algorithm, and I'm going to show that to you in a second. So there it is. And so it's just like a yes-no type of thing. Um, again, there's copies of that for you. So first, you know, you look at your vital signs. If the patient doesn't meet those criteria, 
Uh, well, if the patient does meet them, they come to us. If they don't meet those criteria, then you kind of look at some of the other things. Again, they come to us if they meet that, if not, and you just keep on going down the list. So, and one of the newest things that's come up, you know, in the most recent years is we do get a lot of elderly patients that are on anticoagulants um, that come to us because they either, they have, we see big old scalp laceration, they have a history of a positive loss of consciousness or something like that, we bring them in because these are the patients we want to do a head CT, we want to see if they, their INR is off, we want to reverse them if it is, and we want to do a repeat CT, head CT in any event. The transporting people that come to us are primarily American Medical Response, okay, so that's a private agency. They're all over the country. They're, I think they're even in Canada. They're all over the place. San Diego Medical uh, Enterprises is a public-private agency, so we have the uh, San Diego Fire Department, public, who's um, hooked up with a, um, a, a private ambulance company and it's called San Diego Medical uh, Enterprises and so they serve a lot of uh, southern San Diego. We get a lot of patients from them. Coronado is in our um, uh, catchment area so Coronado Fire brings patients. Mercy Air we don't get too many okay because we our area is so small our catchment area is so small it's faster for them to put the patient into an ambulance and bring them up here than to get the rotors going for the helicopter and that type of thing okay because that takes 20 minutes then they got to land on the highway whatever um, it's good for some of the areas in North County and for Sharps catchment area where they got a lot out in the east because the driving time is longer and lots of times there's more congestion. The only time we usually get somebody from Mercy is if they are up in those northern or eastern areas and that particular hospital is on bypass then they'll bring the patient to us. Or we also have the contract with Donovan, the jails. So that always takes them a long time for the medics. By the time the medics get there, go through the sally port, find the find the patient, bring them back out. They can be calling Mercy Air and saying, this patient's sick, we need you to come. So by the time the medics get the patient out, Mercy Air is there waiting for them. Um, and then, you know, lots of times we will get patients from Scripps CV and from the jail, because we also have the contract. So we got prison contract, we got jail contract, different. And uh, Scripps CV is in our catchment area, so if a patient gets gets brought there by the paramedics and they say, hey, we need a trauma center, or sometimes patients are just brought in by their family members, then they will call us, they call our attending, they say, we got this patient, perfect, we come, we come and, um, they will send us the patient one of two ways. They can call 911, okay? If they call 911, which people aren't crazy about them doing because it brings an ambulance out of service, then, um, they bring the patient, we get a call from the MICN just like we do for every other patient. If they say, oh, we're going to transport with our private company, okay, the patient isn't that sick, doesn't need advanced life support, can have basic life support transporting them, then they'll use their contract um, folks and th those folks don't have to call into the MICN, so, you know. We get a call from Scripps CV, they say we're sending our patient, we figure, okay, we got 20 minutes, up they come, but we're not going to get another call. Imperial County, right now, uh, REACH Helicopter is the primary transport agency for them. Most of our patients come from Pioneers Hospital or El Centro Regional Medical Center. Um, we do sometimes get patients from the scene from REACH, okay, if it's over in our area, if the patient's really sick and they don't want to take them. They can um, bring them straight to us, but we don't get too many of those. Um, if the patient needs to come here for a resource, they have no orthopedic surgeon available um, out there, but the patient's not that sick, they can bring them by ground. Um, and there's a couple other um, helicopter agencies. Aeromedivac is fixed wing, and they have the contract with the Baja 250, 500, 1000. So whenever there's one of those events there, they call me and they say, hey, we got this event going on, tell everybody, oh, we got Baja 500, and we get some patients from them. But basically, they pick the patient up at the scene, or the ambulance brings them to this little uh, um, uh, airport, and they bring the patient to us. So those patients oftentimes have not had any medical care. Okay, I think we pretty much talked about this. Um, again, there's, there's medic units stationed throughout the county, okay? So when they get a call, so we've got somebody down at the airport. The airport is our catchment area. So they've got somebody near the airport, they get the call, they go pick up the patient. Um, and there's um, several other areas as well. And so they just 
you know, when they get the call, they come out and they pick us up. And um, they're supposed to call our base hospital. But especially if they have a sick patient, and if our base is busy, because our volume's really gone up, or we've got one channel on that radio, the, they won't wait. They'll call somebody else. It doesn't matter. They can call Palomar for base hospital information. It doesn't matter where they are. All they need are some base hospital orders. And so they'll call whomever. And then our poor MIC on has to pick up the phone because then Palomar hospitals call, base hospital is calling them on the phone. And they got to call and give them the um, information. They try to give us a full report as often as they can. There's sometimes when the medics are too busy, they can't give a full report. There's sometimes when the MICN is really busy, she can't, she can't get a full report. We have some patients that come in as major trauma victims. These patients go directly up to the resuscitation room. Okay. Sometimes they make them a trauma resource. In other words, the patient looks good, vital signs are okay. Mechanism, though, is kind of severe. This patient could get into trouble. So for these patients, they'll say, we're going to bring them to a trauma center just in case they need a higher level of care. And they call these patients trauma resources. Okay, so this is a trauma resource. So that they bring them in and one of two things can happen. The um, physician, the ED physician down there could look and say, oh no, this is a major trauma. So they'll call the attending and they'll say, we got a patient. They bring the patient right up. So that's when we get pages that say, um, uh, trauma resus ED from ED now. Okay, that means that's the way the patient come in. Sometimes they come in, they work them up a little bit. They'll, the patient doesn't look that bad. They do a C head CT and they see that they've got a subdural. Then they'll call trauma and they'll either bring them up or do a trauma consult. So, uh, let's see. And my scenes have to notice, notify, of course, the recess nurses when we're getting a patient, trauma, 10 minutes ETA. They also have to notify security because the security gets the elevator and brings the patient up top. So um, I think that we don't need to go through all of that. Just a little, little bit to let you know that there is something called Annex D. It's for um, uh, really multi-victim. It could be for disasters, but it's also for multi-victims. So there could be like six patients out there and if there's just not enough help um, and they have somebody at the f scene, okay, directing where the patients are going to go. So they don't follow the trauma rules anymore. So we might get a patient that's not from our catchment area. Um, and, but we oftentimes will get several patients. We don't like to, to go on bypass. We actually have been very good. Dr. Coimbra's feeling is we are the level one and um, we need to serve our community. We do not want to go on bypass. I mean, I think we are on bypass for an average of two hours and 21 minutes um, per month last year, which is just amazing. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. But we want to make sure the patients are safe as well. Right, Lisa? So, so uh, it's only when our trauma room gets full. That's why sometimes we really have to get those patients out of that trauma room because every bed is full. We don't want to go on bi bypass. We don't want to have to um, have the patients go someplace else because sometimes other hospitals go on bypass more than we do. And so if everybody's on bypass, nobody's on bypass. So we have to have that recess room available. We have, have to clear it out as soon as we can so that we can get um, uh, more patients if they come in from the field. Occasionally, if all the ORs are full for us, we go on bypass as well.